Paul, you have to remember, Paul's really talking to the Jewish converts, the Jewish Christians, the, um, and hence the letter to the Romans is not to, to all the Romans in Italy, but it, uh, it's a letter to the uh, Roman Christians, which were more Jewish than they were Gentile. And so he keeps, he keeps bringing up concepts or ways to convince, trying to convince the people to believe in Christ from the Jewish scriptures. If you're not Jewish, you're not going to believe in those scriptures. And so he keeps using these things uh, within the scriptures to convince the, the Jewish uh, um, investigators, if you want to call them that. And he focuses mostly on the law because the Jewish people are more concerned about keeping the law, their obedience to the law, than they are um, the change of heart. And we talked about that last time, but his message is the same this time and, and forever throughout the rest of the uh, New Testament. Paul is always trying to get people to change, change their character. And he shouldn't be doing anything else because that's the whole concept of... Uh, and the whole reason of the law, and that's what he brings out here in these chapters, that the whole purpose of the law was to, to change character, just as he talked about back in chapter 2 and 3 of Romans. Um, the law exists, the ordinances exist in order to change character. So if you look in the introduction of the manual, the manual always says that this is just an aid in your study of the scriptures, and that a teacher... Um, in Sunday school uh, or wherever they're teaching in whatever class they might be teaching um, they're to look over the material and then decide what is going to be what points are going to be the best or most important for the class members and I think that's what a person needs to do the manual gives you a few ideas right, right. Um, it takes I mean we've got a lot of chapters here but the manual takes four or five different ideas and then gives you some background material to use for those ideas be it uh, conference addresses or talks. The manuals just give you ideas. That's all. That's all the manuals are for is to give you some ideas of what you can talk about. But uh, is what I like to do is I go through a chapter and I say, okay, here's some key points in this chapter and this one, or or maybe there's a um, a point or a concept that all of the chapters are trying to get across. And Paul doesn't change. I don't think from the beginning beginning chapters of this book to the chapters that are going to end it. The, the change isn't there. The change is always the change of character. Or the point or the concept is the change of character that's, that Paul's trying to get across. That's why he starts out there in chapter 7, and in, in that verse 1, he says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to speak to you who know the law. I'm talking to you people who are keeping the law of Moses and living that law of Moses, the, you who understand that law. I want to talk to you. And that's when he begins, and that's why the whole discussion begins talking about um, uh, the spirit in the flesh. It's all, it's all change of character. It's, it's, it's what it's all about. The gospel is, is here to assist us in changing character. So the whole, I mean, this whole group of chapters, uh, from where we're starting here in 7 all the way to the end of the, end of the book, is still going to keep dealing with the change of character and the blessing if you change that character. The blessing is becoming an heir and a joint heir with Christ. But the requirement is to is to make that change of character. And the way you do that is recognize, and that's why he starts out here in this particular chapter, you have to recognize that the battle that rages within a person is between the flesh and the spirit. When God created man, or when, when we come as a child... Uh, we're told in Moses chapter 6 that all children are whole from the beginning. We've got a, we've got a perfect spirit but an imperfect body. If we're, we're born with a perfect, pure, innocent, uh, clean spirit. But we come with a body that's going to die. And there's no getting around that. That body's imperfect. It's going to have sicknesses, illnesses, disease, death. It's going to have a lot of different things go wrong with it. So we come with an imperfect body. But while we're here, this becomes an entrance exam for the next life. Life mortality becomes an entrance exam for the next life. And so when we go back, when, we're, when we go back into the next life, then God provides us with a perfect body, one that's going to be resurrected, that's going to have no imperfections in it, not one hair of the head will be lost. It's going to be immortal. There's, 
this corruption of mortality will put on incorruption. So we came with our individual spirit that was perfect into an imperfect body. When we go to the other side, God is going to provide us with a perfect body, and we provide the spirit, the one we developed here. And there's no question it's going to be imperfect. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none good but God. And so we're going we're gonna to have that spirit. Well, that's why Paul's talking about this whole idea of the battle that rages between the flesh and the spirit. And if we let the flesh, the wickedness or the evil of the flesh, and how does Lehi put it? Uh, uh, because of the flesh and the evil contained therein, which doth give Satan power to control mankind because of the flesh. If our spirit becomes subject to the flesh, we've lost it. We've lost the battle. And so Paul bring, keeps bringing up that battle, that we need to fight that battle between the flesh and the spirit, the flesh and the evil contained therein. We always say, when people say, well, why did we come to earth? The, the canned response is to get a body. Well, boy, that's, that's a simple canned response, to get a body. The question is, why did you need a body? Well, you, people will say, well, you have to have a body to be resurrected. You have to have a body to become like God. Uh, the spirit and the element or the body inseparably connected, a man can receive a fullness of joy. That's not, that's not <laughs> those are all good answers, but it's not the right answer. Because we progress so far in the spirit world with our spirits that we now needed we needed a sin machine so that we could overcome, so that our spirit could overcome the, 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 the desires, appetites, and passions of the flesh so the spirit could learn to have control. We needed, we needed, we needed an imperfect body, just like we, were, we come down with a perfect spirit, we get an imperfect body, and then we, that body begins to exercise control and manipulate the spirit as we sometimes want to satisfy every desire, appetite, and passion. Uh, and as we're doing that, we're creating character. We're creating a character. But the whole, concept, the whole reason that we have to have a body is not just because we need a body, but because that spirit needs to be trained to have control over the physical body. And that's what Paul's talking about here. That's what he begins this section of talking about, the battle that rages between the body and the spirit, the flesh and the spirit. Uh, are, we, are, are we making sure that our spirit has control over the fleshly desires, appetites, and passions? Or are we turning ourself, our spirit, and therefore our character over to, the, to those desires, appetites, and passions of the flesh? It's a funny, it's a funny thing. God, God knows that we need to change. He created us in the image and, in His image and likeness. When we come here, our contribution to the atonement, He says, "I'll give you, I'll provide an atonement for you, so that you can be forgiven." But that atonement requires action on our part, and that ac action is the change of character. And so, our contribution to the atonement is to love God and love our fellow man. Christ died for us, and that's His last commandment in John 13 is love one another as I have loved you. And he says, and if you don't do that, you're not my disciples. And so our contribution to the atonement is recognizing, first recognizing how much we need God. And then the second thing is trying to become like God. And that's so true that in John 17, even Christ prayed to the Father. We often call it the intercessory prayer, but Christ is praying to the Father that we would become like him, that we would become one as he and the Father are one. But to become one requires us to develop the character that makes God God, eventually develop, or be, at least be on that, on that road, as Paul explains in these chapters, that we need to be on that road uh, of that character change. God provides us with an imperfect body. We come with a perfect spirit when we're born. When we go to the other side, God's going to provide us with a perfect body. And we're, going to re and we're going to provide that body with the spirit of which we want to be. And that's why DNC 88 talks about that 
those of a celestial spirit will receive a celestial body even the, and a fullness thereof even the same and those of a terrestrial spirit and those of a telestial spirit and we'll receive that which we're willing to receive because we would not receive that which we might have received we'll receive the glory of which we want to be but it's us and our spirit the body is going to be perfect and so we have to provide a spirit and that's why paul is talking so much about the battle that rages between the flesh and the spirit and he talks about how he had that problem, still has the problem. Even when he knows the law, he has that problem. He's trying to explain. Uh, there's things I want to do but can't do and things I can't do but I want to do, you know. And so he's putting himself into the same position, same positions that we're in. Um, but the one thing he's telling us is the law, the commandments are good. Really, verses 5 through 14 are probably the important verses in this one chapter that you could focus on. Commandments... Uh, he tells us that commandments don't save us in our sin. It saves us from our sins. The commandments are given, as he talks about there in verse 9, kind of. He says commandments are given so that we can know where we're going wrong. And a lot of people don't like to feel guilt, but where there's no guilt, there's no remorse. There's no, you know, there's no repentance, as it says in Alma, as it teaches in Alma. But guilt's a very, very good thing, just like pain's a very good thing. If I, if I didn't have pain when I had appendicitis, I'd just lay down and die wouldn't even know it pain is pain in our physical body is to tell us when something's wrong and needs to be changed or needs to be addressed and guilt in our spirit is something that god instilled in us so that we know when something's wrong and when a change needs to be made and so um, these these commandments are to show us the standards or the marks or the targets uh, of which we are to aim in order to create a spirit worthy of a celestial body. There has to, there has to be a choice. And you, if there's no choice to do evil, there's no righteousness in choosing good. If there's no evil, if there's no opportunity to choose one or the other, there's no, there's no good and there's no evil. There's no righteousness. There's no wickedness. So the great, that's the law of opposition that we see there in Second Nephi. Uh, chapter 2, that law of opposition is, is you have to have one in order to have the other. You can't, if there's no opportunity, then there's uh, to choose one or the other, uh, then there can be no righteousness or no wickedness. That's the whole issue with the flood. It says that the people came to a point in their life and in their lifestyle that they did evil continually. Now that means that there was no chance of any good. Um, that means that a child born or, or a person living during that time of Noah would have no chance to become righteous. No chance. And so in an, in an environment like that, your agency is taken away. Um, it, it doesn't exist because if you don't have a chance to choose righteousness in the face of evil, because there is no righteous choices, okay. then, there needs to be, then there needs to be a reset button. For without agency, there's no existence. And so the reset button was the flood. Uh, in order to give all of those spirits, because the world was so wicked, there needed to be a reset button to give any spirits that were going to come to the earth an opportunity to be able to have agency in choosing righteousness or choosing wickedness. But the environment at that time of Noah became so wicked that they had no choice. Now Paul is saying, and in these chapters, Paul is saying we have a choice. And the choice is the battle between the spiritual uh, progression and the fleshly progression. Or the fleshly desires, appetites, and passions. And so, and he's just basically saying we, if we're not choosing the spirit, we're choosing the wrong we're choosing the wrong end. We're choosing the wrong direction, um, so to speak. And so um, that's why he begins talking. That's why he's talking so much about the flesh um, and the spirit. And he begins in this chapter by saying, commands are to show us the direction, the targets, the marks of which the spirit should be seeking. Commandments are not restrictions. They're recipes for happiness. They're recipes for character change to save us from our sins, not in our sins. There's a lot of different religions that think that all you have to do is say, I believe, and then you're saved in your sins. Okay. But Paul teaches over and over again, we have to be saved from our sins, and that's why in chapter 1 he has that whole section on, 
on what can't be in the presence of God. No unclean thing can dwell in the presence of God. And so he speaks about that here in Corinthians and other, other, other places um, in the New Testament, as the Book of Mormon is clear full of that. No unclean yeah, thing can be in the presence of God. Yeah, We are a creature, unlike other creatures and other animals that exist. We're a creature that has a memory for a purpose. Other animals, their memory is more instinctive, just like uh, their actions are more instinct. They have no conception of time. A dog, these animals have no conception of time. They're not going to... They're not going to love you any more if you're gone for 15 minutes than they are for 15 days or 15 months. Their excitement is there because they have no conception of time. But we do. We not only have a, an ability to think of the past and remember the past to and have that past act on the present and in the future. We, there's, there's three things that seem to fall into place when it comes to memory, and Paul's talking about all of them here. One is a memory. We can remember things in the past. Um, the present, in the present, we can have imaginations or think about how we're going to change or what we're going to do in the future. An animal doesn't do that. He doesn't think, well, I think tomorrow I'm going to go out and I'm going to uh, eat a bird or whatever it is, you know, they're, they're, they don't think that I'm going to, they don't think for the future. They have no imagination to imagine for the future, to think for the future. Uh, as I've said before, my my dog rolls over for a treat, but uh, the dog rolls over for a treat to get it right then, not thinking that, I think I'll roll over for a treat so I can get it after I'm dead. Or next week, he's rolling over for a treat right now, and that's. But we have the ability to act in futurity, based on that imagination and our agency. We can act in futurity, so that we can perform an act or, uh, or create a character that's going to either be rewarded or condemned, after death. And see, animals can't do that. So, so when when it comes to history and time. We have a memory to think back on. We have an imagination to look forward on. And then we have an agency to act in the present right now. And which no other animal has. They can't do that. Now, when it comes to sin, so many people often ask God to forgive them of their past sins. You can't sin against God. Well, you can. But we call that blasphemy. Okay. Blasphemy against a member of the Godhead, the Holy Ghost, which is stronger. The, the testimony and the witness of the Holy Ghost to our spirit is stronger than a vision of Christ, the scriptures tell us. And so you can sin against God, but that's blasphemy. That We call that blasphemy or sin against the Holy Ghost. But we don't sin in, in or miss the mark. Uh, sin's not never a good word, but... We don't sin against God. We sin against ourselves. God doesn't kick us out of his presence. We kick ourselves out of his presence. And that's what Mormon's saying there in chapter 9 of, of his book, of, of the Book of Mormon. That we shrink from his presence. We see who we are compared to who God is. Helaman says there in chapter 14 that we, we become our own judges of who we are. And that's why section 88 there, though, says there in those opening uh, opening verses that we will receive that which we are willing to receive because we would not receive that which we might have received. And so we don't sin against God. We sin against ourselves. We cut ourselves off from God. Does, God doesn't cut us off. It's just that his, his justice is no unclean thing can be there and we'll see who we are compared to who he, who he is. And so we really sin against ourselves. And that being the case, what we've done in the past is set in stone. It's there. It's done. It's over. You can't change it. We can remember it, as Alma says. You know, he was harrowed up by the, the pain of his sins until he recognized the atonement and then and realized and remembered the words of his father. And then he was, doesn't say he forgot them, but he was not harrowed up by the pain anymore because he understands. He understood that the past is the past is the past, and there's nothing he can do to change that. It's, it's there. 
So asking God to forgive you of your sins in the past means nothing if you don't change your character from that point on. It doesn't mean anything. There's just no, it's not there. Even, even God says, if you repent, which means to change your character, God says, if you repent, I'll remember your sins no more. Now, God knows the past, present, and future, and it's always continually before him. So if it means that he remembers your sins no more, they don't exist anymore. And okay. the way you repent from the past is change the future. That's, that's the whole issue. You can't sin against God, and he doesn't care who you were yesterday, but he does care who you want to be tomorrow. And that's the change that needs to take place. That's why we have the sacrament every week, because the sacrament is that reset button where we can covenant to be obedient to his commandments from that oh. point on. It's not the past. It's not what we've done in the past. It's from that point on. We're, covenant, we're entering into a covenant of obedience to always remember him, to keep his commandments so that we can have his spirit with us. And so... That's a covenant that begins from that point on. It doesn't cleanse us, but it's saying, okay, I'm going to try and be better th tomorrow than I was yesterday. And you can't, <laughs> people worry so much about what they've done in the past, but the only way to change the past is remember the past, have imaginations for the future, the blessings you can receive in the future, and then you use your agency to act upon that future reality or that future potential of those blessings. And that's what ordinances are for, to give us a hope of a future reality. And that's what Alma 13, 16 says, to give us a hope of a future reality that we might look forward. It says there in Alma 13, 16, that uh, for these ordinances are given after this manner, whereby they might look forward to a remission of their sins. Right. right. And so these ordinances are there to give us a hope of a future reality and a reason to make a change in the present with the hope or an imagination of being washed and pronounced clean or coming forth in that first resurrection. That gives us that imagination for the future and gives us enough <clears throat> power within our own agency to change our character to work for that hope of a future reality, to work for the blessings if we are true and faithful. But the past is past is past. It's gone. And we need to look to the future. We have a memory for a re reason. If there's no law and no consequence, then there's no remorse. And if there's no remorse, then there's no repentance. If there's no repentance, there's no change. And so we have a memory of the past we have a hope of a future. That's our imagination and hope of a future. And then we have the agency to work for that hope. A lot of people spend a lot of time and anguish and frustration and depression thinking about what they've done rather than thinking about what they're going to do. And that's that's what needs to be that's that's what repentance is all about. Repentance is a word that work that works only in the future. You don't repent of what you've done. You repent repentance means change your character. You repent by what you're gonna do. God's not gonna I mean, what you've done is past. It's over with. Consequences have already happened. The people you've hurt, you've hurt, but you repent, i.e. change your character for the future. And people worry so much about what they've done in the past, and they don't realize that if we believe in eternal progression, we have to believe in eternal change. And change is the most prominent thing in the world. And our progression, spiritual progression, is based on that change and that's what that's the that's the gospel of repentance is we're changing our character we exercise faith faith <clears throat> faith is a it's talked about a little bit about here in these chapters and it will be later on faith is is a verb in the new testament and faith has to be in in something in to or towards something faith has to be in something and so we talk about faith in Christ. It has to be in something. Faith has to be, it has to be directed towards something. 
And because it's an action verb, and we see that all through Paul, I just wrote a, a little thing about it, um, but because faith is an action verb, there's action, there's actions that are required that are connected to your faith. And so Amulek there in Alma 34, there in verses 15 through 17, he says we exercise our faith in Christ, exercise our faith in Christ unto repentance, unto the change of character. So it's faith in Christ, the atonement and resurrection, unto the change of character. That's the action. And James puts it very simply. Faith without any action, faith without any works, and the works are repentance. The works are changing character. It's not ordinances. It doesn't mean ordinances. It has nothing to do with ordinances. As Paul said earlier there in, that, in chapter 2 and 3, if you don't make a character change, the ordinances are worth nothing. But James is saying faith without the change of character is dead. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, boy, you need to change your spirit. And that's what he's going after here. Even in, in chapter 8, he's talking about, he even talks about the ordinances and hope there in verses 24. What are we going to hope for? Right. right. I mean, he's, he's talking about the hope, which is that we repent because there is a hope of a future reality. We change our character because there's a hope of a future reality. And so that's really what he's getting at. And that's why when he comes to the end of that, he begins talking about, I mean, he even talks about the in, in chapter 9 there, in, in starting in verse 4 and, and on, he starts talking about, well, who are the Israelites? The Israelites are those who are changing character. The old cliche in the Book of Mormon um, is the righteous are those repenting, the unrighteous are those who are not repenting. And it doesn't matter whether you're a direct descendant of Abraham or not. The righteous are those that are repenting, who are trying to change their character. And that's what, and that's what we see when it comes to the seed of Abraham. The Lord, the Lord tells Abraham this posterity, you're going to have literal posterity and you're going to have ad adopted posterity. And whichever one, those who accept the gospel become the seed of Abraham. It says there in chapter 2 of Abraham, starting in about verse 10 and 9. Um, he says, if you accept the gospel, you become the seed of Abraham. And by virtue of doing that, then you have a responsibility for, this, for the spiritual welfare of all the rest of humanity. For the blessings of salvation and life, to provide the blessings of salvation and life eternal. And so you become the seed of Abraham, and with that comes a, res comes a responsibility. But if you don't change your character to bear and be worthy for that responsibility, then you're not the seed of Abraham. That's what Christ was telling him when he says, I can take these stones and turn them into the seed of Abraham. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. right. He says, you're, you claim to be the seed of Abraham, but by your works you prove that you are not. And so there, there is a responsibility of, of becoming the seed of Abraham and doing what you're supposed to be doing. But the works are works of righteousness, those who are repenting. That's why Christ said in Luke that there's the publican and the Pharisee. And the publican was more righteous than the Pharisee, who is the active member of the Jewish church at that time. He was the active member. There, there's the sinner, the publican. But he says the publican was more righteous because he was repenting. As the Pharisee was standing at the pulpit, patting himself on the back, explaining and exclaiming how righteous he was because he was the seed of Abraham and he was keeping the law. Christ said, of the two, the publican is more righteous than the one active in the church, telling us you can be totally active in the church and completely inactive in the gospel. That's what right. Christ was explaining. But if you're active in the gospel, exercising faith unto repentance, you will want to be active in the church of Jesus Christ if you're active in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we sometimes turn those around a little bit. We try and convert people to the church of Jesus Christ before we convert them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's when they fall away is when, when they're converted to the church first rather than the gospel. But anyway, that's uh, these are all things that Paul's talking about in these chapters, in chapters nine and you know eight and nine, talking about the spirit. Chapter ten, uh, even later on in chapter nine, uh, starting verse twenty-seven, he starts talking about a remnant who are going to be spared, quoting Isaiah chapter eleven and talking about Isaiah chapter six and Isaiah chapter eleven. 
and how those who accept the gospel, and this is what he's explaining there from ver- verse 8 of chapter 9 of Romans, is referring to Deuteronomy chapter 9 and those who thought they were chosen, which you need to draw a line over to chapter to verse 27 of that same chapter, verse 27 through 32. And he's talking about the remnant that are going to be spared. And the remnant are those repenting. The remnant are those who are accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is faith in him, repentance, changing your character, um, baptism, entering into a covenant of obedience, and then the blessing of the gift of the Holy Ghost. Everything comes down to Christ. Everything does. Now we have a we have a, t- a tendency, if you remember, this is going back in, in, our, in our lessons this year, but if you go back to Matthew 16 where Christ says to um, the apostles, who do men say that I am? Right. Some, uh, some said El- Elias, Elijah, uh, Enoch. Uh, they use all these things. And he says to Peter, but, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Christ says, uh, Peter, flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And thou art Peter, thou art a Petros, a small stone, and upon this Petra, this foundation stone, am I going to build my church? Now, you can hear all kinds of discussion on what that foundation stone is, but if you actually look at the context and look at the object of discussion, it's thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the rock upon which the church is going to be built. And that's what's being said there. When Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, Christ then says, upon this rock, upon that truth, am I going to build my church? Now, if anybody knows what, what Christ was talking about and who the rock is, it's Peter. And if you look at Peter, I think it's Second Peter, um, there... Um, Peter says, I think it's seven times in four verses, that Christ is the rock. He is the stone. Um, He is the chief cornerstone. Um, And he talks about that being the rock. But then if you look in chapter 10 of Romans, and what you brought up there in in 3 Nephi, in verse 4 of Romans, it says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. He's the end of the law. Everything comes down to that. The church has to be built upon Christ. That's why Joseph Smith said that the foundation of our church rests upon Christ, his atonement and his resurrection. And Paul is saying that too here, trying to go back to what Christ said in the Sermon on the Mount, that Christ is the end of the law, that all of the law, all of the Mosaic law, was a schoolmaster to point them unto Christ. And that's why he starts out in chapter seven. I'm going to talk to you who know. I'm going. To, I want to talk to you people who know the law. He's talking to the Jewish people. He says, "I want to talk to you who know the law." And then he comes back and here in chapter ten, he's saying, "Okay, here's what the law was all about." In between that, he's talking about change of character. Now he's saying, "Here's what the law is all about. It's about Christ." So. Um, he began. He begins, and he says he's almost quoting quoting Christ's Sermon on the Mount. He is the end of the law. There in verse uh, in verse 4 of chapter 10. It doesn't matter who you are, if you call upon and believe in Christ, you become, as it says there in Abraham chapter 2, you become the seed of Abraham. So it becomes uh, this whole concept. And we, he talks about the remnant in verse uh, 27 of, of chapter 9 he, and who the remnant are, and then he brings it up again in chapter 11. Uh, he talks right, about right. St- starting from verses 1 through verses 6, ba- six basically, but uh, specifically in chapter 5, or in verse 5. He talks about the remnant. There's always the rule, what I call the rule of the remnant. In Isaiah chapter 6, the Lord tells Isaiah, he says, I want you to go out and preach. I want you to teach uh, to these people. He says, but their, but their ears are going to be heavy and their hearts are going to be heavy and their ears are going to be full they're, and they're not going to be able to understand. And I'm sure Isaiah's, I'm sure it's what Isaiah said, then why go teach them? And then the Lord tells him there uh, in chapter 6, well, about 10% of them are going to listen. If you remember the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel after Elijah kills the priests of Baal and 
And then Jezebel says, you're a dead man walking by this time tomorrow. You're going to be dead. And Elijah takes off and he, he heads down to Beersheba and he uh, stays down there uh, a few nights, orders out for pizza. And then he heads on down to Mount Sinai and ends up going into, a, into his man cave down there. Um, and he starts to get depressed. And the Lord says, what's wrong with you? And, and Elijah says, look, I've been doing all this preaching. I think this is chapter 19, Kings there. He says, I've been doing all this preaching and nobody's listening. And the Lord says to him, he says, you don't know. You don't know, but there's about 7,000 people in Israel that's heard the message. And that's kind of the rule of the remnant. The remnant are always the ones spared. And we like to think within the church that the church is the remnant. And the church isn't the remnant. There's a remnant within the church. Just like there was a remnant within the Nephites. And that's what uh, Christ is talking about in Matthew 25 uh, when he's when he starts talking about the wise and the foolish virgins or the faithful and the unfaithful servants or the sheep and the goats he's talking about a remnant within those within those who know and understand the gospel and being in that remnant we have to decide uh, are we the remnant are we part of the masses masses uh, are we the ones listening? There's a couple of things you know about the remnant and a couple of things you don't know. You don't know where they are and you don't know who they are. But you can know for sure that there's, the remnant are listening and the remnant are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so we have to decide, are we the remnant that are, that's following the word of the Lord? That's, that's why Elijah begins this whole story of the priests of Baal with the statement, how long will you halt between two opinions? How long will you have a foot in Babylon and a foot in Zion? How long are you going to do it? God says, I, if you're, I would that you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out because you think you can live in, you can, you can be active in Satan's Babylon and go to church in Sunday with those that belong to Zion. You think you're safe. He says, I would that you were hot or cold because of being lukewarm, you're, you're not. And it doesn't say spew you out of your mouth in the Greek. It says vomit you out. <laughs> it's, that, that's what it says. And he says, how long are you going to halt between two opinions? Make up your mind. Are you going to be a remnant? Or are you going to be the masses? And that's what I call the rule of the remnant. We have to make that decision because only a remnant is spared. The remnant are listening. The remnant are sticking to the scriptures. That's how you can't be deceived according to Matthew 24. Only those um, who listen to the word of God are not going to be deceived. Only those who are holding on to the iron rod make it to the tree of life uh, in Lehi's dream. So we have to decide, are we, the, are we the masses or are we part of the remnant? And Paul is saying, it's in chapter 8, I think it's verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they become the sons of God. So you have to choose to be that remnant. You have to choose to be led by the Spirit of God. Are you going to be part of the remnant or are you going to be part of the mass man? Uh, and so Paul's bringing up these concepts that are, uh, especially the remnant concept there in chapter, uh, chapter 9, 27, when he starts quoting Isaiah there in chapter 11 about the remnant um, <clears throat> that's going to be spared. Things aren't going to change. Yeah, It's right. the gospel of repentance. That means the gospel of character change. Just any time you read the word repentance in Scripture, you just need to read character change. The gospel of repentance is the gospel of character change. And that can't happen in the past. You can't change right. that. Right. It's now and in the future. Oh, the famous quote of Benjamin is the natural man is an enemy to God and always will be unless he puts off that natural man. That's the character change. And becometh a saint. That's the character change. Willing to submit to all things that God will inflict upon him. That's the character change. Willing to keep the commandments. That's the character change. We must retain in remembrance our own nothingness before God. And then he says that we... We retain a remission of our sins by loving our fellow man. That's what Alma is teaching in, in Mosiah 18. If, you, if you're going to participate in the gospel of character change, the gospel of repentance, 
he begins that before he baptizes Helaman there. He says, if you have a desire to mourn with those who have a cause to mourn, not stop their mourning, but mourn with them, and to comfort those who stand in need of comfort, to bear one another's burdens. And he says, what have you against then of entering into a covenant to be a different person? That's the law of the gospel. The gospel is faith, repentance, baptism, the gift of the Holy Ghost. The law of the gospel is loving other man, you know, lo loving other people, as it says there in um, D and C one hundred and four, verse eighteen, taking care of those around you. That's why Christ's last commandment of mortality is love one another as I have loved you. And then he says, and if you don't, you can't. You are not my disciples. You are not a Christian if you don't have that character. And that's why Paul is talking about this, this, whole, this whole battle between the flesh and the spirit is changing your character for, to that character that loves God and loves your fellow man. The story of Elijah is just, I, I just love that story. When I go to Mount Carmel, I, just, I love going over that story because Elijah goes from, from Mount Carmel where the priests of Baal, where he gets the people to decide uh, to either worship Jehovah or worship Baal. And, and then he goes all the way back to Sinai where the law begins. See, it's, he makes a complete circle in it. He, he starts there on Mount Carmel, establishes Jehovah again. Then he goes down to where the law was given at Mount, Carmel, at Mount Sinai. And that's where he stays when the Lord talks to him. And he's there. He says, this is where it all began. I've tried to do everything. Maybe it's going to stop here. And the Lord says, well, you don't know. There's a remnant out there. There's still a remnant that's listening out there. We don't know who they are. We don't know where they are. All we know for sure about them is that there's a remnant listening. listening. And so um, that's, what, that's what he's talking about more than, uh, more than anything else in these, in these chapters. But he's telling us that you have to fight that battle put off the flesh, or as King Benjamin says, put off the natural man. The natural man is an enemy God and always will be unless he puts off the natural man, that's the flesh, and then becometh a saint. And that's what Paul's trying to establish here. He's telling these, these Jewish members that, boy, you, ha you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity for blessing. And Abraham's covenant is that he and his posterity would bring the blessings of salvation and life eternal to all nations of the earth, to everyone. And they could be grafted back in to perform a great work. And it's the same with us. We have that opportunity, but we don't often look at the responsibilities. There's no rank in the kingdom. There's only responsibilities. And we have to make a choice whether we're going to take that responsibility and go with it or whether we're going to become as those who rejected Christ, who rejected the response, who rejected the rights, both R-I-T-E-S and R-I-G-H-T-S, of Abraham. You know, consecration is anything that, uh, any, your time, your talents, and anything that God has blessed you with, and that's your mind. But <clears throat> the mind is really the beginning of righteousness and sin. You know, it's you make a decision in your mind whether you what you're going to do, whether it's going to be good or, or bad, that that sin begins there. That's why uh, we learn in the Book of Mormon that by your words, your works and your thoughts will condemn you at the last days because that that's your character. Put all three of those together, words, works and thoughts, and that's who you are. And that's why in Alma it talks about that, that the, our condemnation will be because of our words, our works, and our thoughts. And that's why we have to renew our mind because the sin or righteousness, the change, the agency that's used to make the character change begins in the mind and will go forth from that mind uh, into your words and your works. Go on from verse 9, he's talking about helping, helping the saints, helping other people. Uh, taking care of them. The hospitality he talks about in verse 13, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you and bless and, and, and curse not. You know, you, that's the way Paul was. Every time he was in prison, he ended up with converts. And if, it, if, it wasn't, if it wasn't his fellow prisoners, it was with the jailers and their families. In verse 21, you know, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Right. See, right. see, it's all kind. It's all. It's still all character change, whether we want to accept it or not. It's all character change that Paul's talking about. 
it's hard to understand why so many different people think that they're saved in their sins rather from their sins. And it's the agency that helps us be saved from our sins. But beginning in verse 8 through 10, you know, he's talking about loving your fellow man. He says, just like James says, if you, if you love one another, you've kept the whole law. In verse 8, if you love one another, you've fulfilled the law, which is almost the same thing we read back there in John and James in the further on in the, in the letters. We don't talk about um, character change. We, there's very few talks on repentance, and there's and what few talks there are on repentance. There's there's even fewer talks on the con or on the idea that repentance means character change. You know, the, when Christ comes, we're told in the Book of Mormon that when the second coming takes place, that Satan will be bound, but he's bound by not by not physically bound. He says he's bound by the righteousness of the people because if he wasn't there to tempt us, there could be no righteousness during that millennium. He has to be there and we have to choose righteousness in the presence of evil for righteousness even to exist. And so he's bound by the righteousness of the individuals. Now that means, if that's true, which it is, that means that your millennium can begin anytime you want it to. You can bind Satan in your own heart. Your millennium can begin right now. If you want to. And that's what he's and that's what he's saying. It's live the law. And the law is to love God and love your fellow man. We have this agency to make changes from this point on and into the future. And we we worry so much about the past and what's happened and what happened to us and who I don't like and what I did in the past. <laughs> Can't say yeah, it enough. Yeah. The past is the past is the past. And it's and cast in stone. Energy. I'm doing some work on covenantal time. There's different types of time or ways to look at time. Linear time is really for the atheist. You know, you live and you die. You're just, it's one event after another until your death. Uh, that's linear time. Cyclical time is more Eastern, an Eastern view. You know, things go in cycles and comes around and reincarnation. Well, that just means it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to do it again anyway. You know, it's just, <laughs> if you're going to be reincarnated, you're coming back, you're coming back to start all over again. It's almost no purpose, but, but, but um, covenantal time is a little bit different. And that is you act in futurity. I gave the example of the dog not rolling over for a treat after its death. We have the ability to roll over for a treat that's coming after death. We can do that. That's acting in futurity. And our view of time should be eternity. Our view of time should be that life really begins after death, that death is an event we live through. And what we do in this life needs to be in connection to what the reality of time. I mean, what's 70 years compared right. to 70 billion years and counting? It's nothing. It's a night dream. But it's where it, this, this is a training ground for our spirit to gain control over the flesh. That's why it says in the Book of Mormon, the days of men are prolonged that they might repent. We live longer than we need to so that we can learn to change our character. Uh, and that's what it means. The days of men are prolonged. They live longer than almost every single animal dies um, when it's past the age of procreation. Almost every single animal dies, except for mankind. And the days of men are prolonged so that they might repent, so that they might change their character. Um, and so the whole idea is that the faithful, it, it even talks about, I don't remember the verse, the passage, Talks about how Abraham, I think for saying it could be in Hebrews, for Abraham was a stranger and foreigner on the earth and considered himself a stranger, but sought for the city of God. See, his view was beyond this life. That's where his view was. That's then that's why I call it covenantal time, because it's Abraham's time, it's it's Enoch's time, it's it's all of the righteous prophets. It's the, it's their it's their mental time frame, and that is eternity. And we get so distracted by mortality that we often forget uh, eternity. And it's it's looking at eternity 
that helps us make the choices that we have here. That's the whole idea of looking to the future, of having an, being able to have an imagination because we can recognize what potentials there are out there in order to change our actions today, using our agency to change our actions today. And agency only functions, it's, it's a weird thing about agency. Every decision you make is, is, is pre-programmed. Now, everybody's going to argue with me with that, but every, every decision you make that's not a moral or righteous decision is pre-programmed. If, if, if I go into the theater to watch a movie, where I set has been, I mean, and I could say, well, I can set anywhere I want to set, but in the back of my mind, subconsciously, I may go uh, want to set on this row, uh, this far up from the bottom, uh, and this chair closest to the aisle, because somehow I've been pre-programmed. If, if there's two cookies on the table, and I can say, well, I've got agency to, eat, to choose which one of those cookies I want, it might be that I want to choose the big one. Or I might want to choose the chocolate chip instead of the peanut butter cookie because I've been pre-programmed to satisfy my desires, appetites, and passions or that I don't like peanut butter. So the agency I use to choose the cookie or find the seat that I'm going to set in is not really free agency in the way we look at it because there's outside influences in, in, in temporal mortal choices. We are influenced, whether we understand it or not, we are influenced by all of these outside experiences and influence that, that lead us to a certain direction uh, or in a certain path to make a specific decision in mortality. So that agency is not really free. Now, agency really steps up really really comes into play this free this concept of free agency comes into play when our physical body says i want you to satisfy my desires appetites and passions i don't want one cookie i want a whole box of cookies but when it comes to a moral decision a moral decision and our desires appetites and passions say i think we would like this a little better and we say okay, I am going to go against everything I've experienced, all of the influences that are tempting me and outside influences that are trying to force me in that direction, and I'm going to use my agency to be a better person. And that's what Paul's talking about here. Don't, don't get in fights with these people that fight with you. I mean, the natural tendency is to hit them back. And he's saying, don't do that. That's when, you're, that's when you're free agents. That's when your agency really works is when you, you're choosing a righteous path when everything in you, the natural man says, to go the other direction. So that's why it says in Moses 5 that, that Adam's, those three generations of Adam's children that were on the ground when he gets the gospel, it says only after he taught them the gospel, only afterwards, and when Satan came among them and saying, believe it not, and they believed it not, and they loved Satan more than God, it says, once they had the gospel, now that they had a moral compass, it says, right, right. men from that time forth became carnal, sensual, and devilish because they were making moral choices. But it's the moral choices that you have free agency in. We have to come to the point to where our character seeks for, receives, and can be obedient to a fullness of light and truth. And that's what section 93 is talking about. We have to seek for, be worthy to receive, and then be obedient to a fullness of light and truth.